Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast, it's brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are back here yet for another episode. I'm here with a relatively new friend of mine, Kesha Lambert. Kesha, thank you so much for making time to hang out with me today and and chat a little bit. I, I've I've only we've only gotten a chance to hang out in person, I guess, a couple of times. But uh, you feel like a longer term friend. I, I really appreciate you making time to to chat with our listeners and kind of share with them today. Thank you so much, Nathan. Uh, I, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Well, and we, we had the chance to connect initially via conversation. I think WPPI was the first time, but then we had the opportunity to attend the same workshop. You were actually teaching at, at this workshop, I believe. But I, I got to not only hang out with, with you and, and chat a little bit with yourself, but also your husband, who is quite the personality and talent in and of himself. And uh, we had just a great, great time connecting in, uh, I think it was Connecticut, right? Yes, it was Connecticut, the Inspire Photo Retreat. And Neil, my husband, he does have the, the large personality. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we, we balance each other out. I'm the quiet, kind of reserved person, and he worked the room guy. <laughs> well, I think he and I were talking tech and music and, and yeah, he's, he's so easy to talk to and get along with. And yeah. I, it's interesting to me that you say you're the quiet and reserved one because you have a presence about you. Maybe it is that kind of quiet strength, a quiet confidence that is, is a really beautiful thing, especially as somebody who not, of course, is not only a photographer, but also a, a speaker or a teacher. And you command a certain presence in front of the room, which is which is really really lovely. We were, in fact, you and I were actually talking about the, the significance of being able to communicate an idea or a concept effectively. This is a this can be a difficult thing, but it starts with commanding presence in a room, and and you certainly do that. And not only that, you have developed a a photography business. Um, I mean, I'm looking just at your Instagram account here, and and you've got quite a following, but not only do you have a following, but your your talent set, the quality of photography that your business is putting out, the reach that you have in the industry is is all quite significant, it seems. Um, so I have to give you major props for all of that. Thank you. Uh, it's been a growth process, you know, the result of seeds being planted years ago. <laughs> and here we are. Thanks. So thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Well, and again, it's our privilege truly to, to to have you on the show and and get to learn from you a little bit. And on that note, let's just kind of jump right in because we have a lot to cover. We're going to actually talk a little bit later on kind of as our primary point of focus or conversation today about how to go about bringing on associate photographers and in, in some ways kind of move beyond ourselves, right? It, it's, it's what enables us to grow on so many levels, but particularly when it comes to hiring somebody on or delegating our work to, to a team. So we're going to get to that in more detail in a bit, but talk to us just briefly about where your photography business is based and what type of service uh, your business is offering. Sure. So I am based in New York, New Rochelle, New York, to be exact. We serve our, our immediate uh, service area is the New York City tri-state area. Okay. I also work with clients all over the country and internationally. I consider myself to be a people photographer. So we focus on weddings and portraits and all of the things that people do <laughs> in their lives. So a lot of uh, portrait work and event work surrounding people and milestone, milestone events. Yeah, well, it's very clear on your site. And for those of you listening in, if you want to, to visit Kesha's site, you can go to Kesha, K-E-S-H-A Lambert, L-A-M-B-E-R-T dot com. And very clearly you say, welcome to Kesha Lambert Photography, weddings, portraits, events. It's right up there in front. So if somebody comes to visit your site, they know exactly what it is um, as far as the services that you offer and there are beautiful examples there and a beautiful portrait of you as well, standing on the beach there and, and a little bit of a get to know you uh, text and, and even video actually that you link to there. But this is actually a great segue, though, into my next question, which has to do with your brand position. I'm, I'm curious, 
I know that you're a people photographer, but there are a lot of people photographers out there. How do you differentiate yourself from the other wedding and portrait and event photographers, particularly in your very large and busy market? So a major component of my brand message is signature. We provide a signature experience for each of our couples that we are very much client focused and carving out uh, a final collection of images that speak to who the client is and not just working from a playbook for each wedding. So a big part of my brand message is that while I have a style and approach and a philosophy to photography, we want each individual client's wedding to have its own signature. And behind that, is a whole lot of research and homework and time invested in getting to know the client and listening to them actively and taking that intel that we get and putting it into our work. Yeah, which is, I mean, the, the last thing that anybody wants to feel is like they're just part of a, like a templated experience, right? You're, you're doing the same thing for everyone People like to feel special. They like to feel significant. And focusing on delivering that type of experience is really important. But how do you effectively communicate to a potential client that this is what they're going to get when they come to you? I, I'm looking at your homepage there, and there's no clear indication of that signature experience. I mean, as far as the actual experience where you're saying, hey, you come see me. This is what I give to you. So do you communicate that via your your marketing and advertising? Do you communicate that via references, relationships that you've already established? Those people are saying, hey, you got to go see Kesha because this is the experience that, that she's going to provide you. How do you communicate it? So I communicate it's this this message is it appears throughout the client experience. Okay. It's embedded in the way I interact with people before they even become a client. If you follow my Instagram, anytime there is an anecdote or a story, I do a mix of, of posting images with short captions. Mm. But anytime I do share a lengthier post with an anecdote or a backstory, you'll find those, those elements in, in the message. Also on my website, there is a brand video that shows some behind the scenes. And that's a big part of what I speak about in the brand message. Okay. Yeah. And and by the way, you mentioned your your Instagram account too. And, and as I did earlier, and I have to, to let everybody know that's listening in, you can find that at, of course, Instagram.com slash Kesha Lambert, uh, just like the website. We're going to link to both of these in the show notes uh, if you go to Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com, for those of you listening in, make sure you take advantage of the show notes. Uh, a lot of resources there, including those that we're going to discuss today. We'll also link to the website and Instagram. But I, I appreciate you you sharing your approach there, Kesha. And let's keep moving, too, because uh, you've been in business for how many years now? So full-time, it's hard to chart it. <laughs> but full-time, I've been in business for a little over five years. Okay. I have I started out as a dabbler in photography many years ago, over ten years ago. And it was just during the time that you were you were an attorney as well? Yes. So while I was in law school, photography was kind of always there. It started out very cliche, you know, started out as a hobby. Sure. Turned into a freelance thing, something that I became obsessed with. Always there while I pursued my career as a as a lawyer. It was my passion pursuit that I did outside of my then legal career. And then it shifted into more. So I, I, mark, I shot my first wedding in 2011. I, wasn't, I still wasn't full time. I still had one foot in the door <laughs> with practicing. But I shot my first wedding in 2011, then transitioned to full time kind of organically. It, it, it wasn't... I, that's why it's kind of hard for me to mark when I actually started, but I can say that I've been full time as a photographer for for at least a solid five years, where I, I, I've I'm no longer practicing. Okay, well, and where I was going with this, I'm I'm curious over that span of time, in this case, full time for about five years. What would be the most significant lesson that you've learned as a photography business owner? That thing that you would jump to share with you know, a fellow photographer, if you had 15, 20 seconds to do so, what, what comes to mind? 
there are very many things, but the biggest one for me would be to be consistent. Mm. Uh, and it's pretty simple concept. Growing a business, being an entrepreneur, being a photographer, uh, there are going to be periods where things really make you feel like throwing in the towel. They, you know, this happens for a lot of people, maybe not everyone. When I started out, my enthusiasm was on level 2000 <laughs> yeah. and you know, like big, I, all the, all the naysayers or the people who said, you know, you can't the statistically, you're not going to do well as a photographer. I, you know, my enthusiasm was so high. I didn't even hear those things. Yeah. And I want my big, the one piece of advice that I would give is to keep that energy throughout the highs and lows to be consistent in, in, in your, your passion be consistent in your work ethic, even at the times when it feels like, there, you know, I've had periods where it felt like my efforts were in vain. And those are the times that you double down and push through. And what, I mean, this is an interesting topic because I, I've personally, I mean, this is something that I've struggled with in the past and am working at being more consistent. I'm working at being more consistent with being consistent. It's kind of ironic, a little bit, right. but but it's it's honestly my tendency, and I've talked about this on the podcast before. My tendency, I know personally, uh, on an emotional level, is at least has been anyway a bit of a, a roller coaster, and I still I still struggle with that, honestly, at least internally anyway. You know where I get extremely like you're talking about that level two thousand high, that excitement, that energy you just throw down, and then and then it falls off. I love the the rush of feeling that way. But then I burn out or something happens internally where I lose that momentum and that excitement and that energy. And then I tend to kind of respond to almost an extreme and pull way, way back rather than fighting some happy medium somewhere and staying consistent with it. So right. have you found a particular way to, to go about maintaining that type of consistency? Uh, I mean, is there a particular trick or tip or technique or something that, that has enabled you to do so? Sure. For me, it's mindset based. Okay. So the first thing is to is awareness that you are in that space. Anytime that anytime I'm aware that I'm in a space where something is sucking away my mojo or or taking away at my enthusiasm or drive, that awareness triggers a voice in in me, and that's the point when I tell myself, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, self-talk, if that makes sense. Sure. So that's the point where I am very intentional and deliberate about putting in the extra effort to, to balance out the fact that I'm going through that something that is telling me to stop or yeah. to throw in the towel. So it's pep talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's a first, it's first an awareness that I'm in this space. And just being very intentional, even even if emotionally that 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 motivation is lacking, just simply calling my own attention to it and being intentional about pushing through it. Yes, helps me to get past it. Yeah, it's that pushing through, and I, I think uh, I mean I know I can speak for myself personally, but I've also seen this at least in social media. I get the sense that there is a tendency with a lot of people, including myself, again to. Um, to expect to feel good about something in order to do it. And it's not mm -hmm. always going to carry that high with it, right? And and so right. just that simple realization and acknowledgement, and then, like you said, the awareness, which then enables you to say, all right, I may not be feeling it right now, but I know on the other side of this is a reward of sorts, right? I'm, even if right. it's just the reward for being consistent and having, and even a, a small way, moved my business forward that day or that week, I know that pushing through this, I'm going to feel better on the other side of this. I can't, I can't let my my kind of habits or my daily workflow fluctuate just because I happen to be a little bit down today. I need to push through it. It's a simple thing, but that that proactive uh, approach, that mentality, as you alluded to, is so so important. It makes a difference. I've certainly found this, particularly in the last two or three years making more of an effort to be consistent, to push through, to follow through, regardless of how I might feel in the moment. Just because I'm not in that high doesn't mean that I then have an excuse to, you know, just to kind of shut down altogether. It's such a detrimental uh, mentality or approach to life. So I, I love this piece of advice. I think it's great. And for all of our listeners, 
take this to heart. Um, develop certainly a certain level of self awareness where you can feel that that tendency coming on, and just push through it. Because I promise, on the other side of it is is the reward, whether small or great. Um, I think that's a great piece of advice. What would you say is the most impactful business or self help book, audio book that you've read or listened to? And and I can expand this too because I know in recent conversations on the podcast, it, I've had a couple of people say, you know what, I I don't even actually read really. So maybe it's a podcast or maybe it's just you have a mentor. What's your best and biggest source of of learning? So I can answer your question about the self-help books. Uh, I I love a good self-help book, but confession, I don't think I've actually ever completed any of them. (laughs) So (laughs) I have a library full of half read or half listened to. I'm an audible girl. Yeah half listen to self-help books. I love books surrounding interaction with people. Okay. So how to win friends and influence people is one of them. Five essential people skills, which is also from Dale. And I enjoy those books because big part of what I do is understanding people major component because this is, yes, I'm providing a service, but it's a service for something that is attached to a high level of sentiment, mm. meaning. And so it's super important for me. And especially since a big part of my goal is to provide a signature experience for my couples, for the clients that we work with. I think it's important to understand people, understand how to interact successfully with people. And so I spend a lot of time half reading <laughs> self-help books about about interactions with with people. And then also I do have like I have you know, I'm very protective about who I let in on, you know, my vulnerability and when it comes to business. Sure. And but I do have a think tank of sorts, people who are in the industry and we consult with each other, we cheer each other on and it and it, I think it's very important to have your people. <laughs> yeah, and for this, sure. You know, it's very important to have people that you can just bounce ideas off of, people who can talk you off the ledge <laughs> when needed, yeah. proverbial ledge. And so I do have that. It's not an official mentoring group, but we do mentor each other. And you talked about being really careful about who or how many people you let in. So is it a pretty small group? It is a very small group. Now, I... I and and I'm talking the unedited, yeah. so this, you know, because I do have, I'm active in, in the photography community and I have, I, I, I call them, we call them frienders. I have quite a few frienders, but, you know, those who really see you at your, at your absolute most vulnerable periods as, as a, as a person, as a, both a business person, as a mom, as an individual, that group is very small and, and people who we've kind of been on this journey together for, for years. Yeah. It's so good to have, even if it is just a few people, people that you can go kind of let your hair down, your proverbial hair down or to, to, yes. to just unload with, right? Like have a drink, have a conversation and, and really truly open up without the filter. Right. That is in this day and age in particular, and I know I talk about this a lot in the podcast, but there is a tendency in our culture and in our industry in particular for most conversations to be surface level. I mean, you go to a conference and the average conversation goes something like, hey, how are you doing? How's your business? When did you get in? It's just right. this really simple, basic surface level stuff. And honestly, I'm so tired of that. And then a lot of it feels kind of fake because it's it's like somebody has to do this lip service in order to get through this interaction and then they're going to move on and forget about you. I'd rather have a, a much deeper conversation. The reality is that we all ha- only have so much capacity for those deeper relationships. And, and, I, and I get that we want to have a certain comfort level if we really truly are going to open up to someone. And so having that, that core group of people that we can go to is such a big deal, even if they aren't going to give you advice per se, just to have that support structure. It's very important to feel, to have, as you said, have that support structure. No man is an island is the, is the saying, you know, you, you should not have to walk, this walk without having people to open up to sometimes simply sharing a thought or talking out something can help you to move from stuck to motivated so yeah. it's important to have 
have have your 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 core group. Yeah, it's so funny how that works. I, it, I I do find myself kind of thinking out loud at times, and then you you have the realization as a result of it. And that wouldn't necessarily have happened as easy if you had you know been thinking about it internally. But the moment you start to have a conversation, you say these things out loud. That person almost doesn't have to answer because you're like, "Oh, I get it." Right. <laughs> exactly. And then you can move on. That's that's great. Talk to me about the photography side of things, and more specifically, your camera bag. And I, this has been a really fun question as of late. What is the most unusual item in your camera bag uh, that enables you to be a better photographer? And this doesn't have to be a camera or lens. It could be t- something just totally random. What comes to mind? So the most unusual thing, I I have a couple of, I, I don't know how, they're not strange necessarily. So I have, I try to have a snack in my, yes. my camera bag. What is your go-to snack? I love cashews. Do you? Um, me too. Do you like do you like them like unsalted, salted? I love raw cashews. Okay, raw cashews. Well, I I, I I'll take them all. I take cashews in any form. <laughs> okay. Have you ever had those? What is it? I think it's a um like a pickled flavor cashew. Have you ever had those before? I have not. Uh, the pickling is throwing me off. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a random kind of weird thing. I, I haven't had them a ton, and I, I wish I could remember the brand off the top of my head, but I had these a while back, and it, it's, yeah, it's surprising. You don't expect it, but it's a little bit of a different flavor. Anyway, raw cashews, snack time. I, I totally get that. Snacks. As a wedding photographer, we sometimes go for hours where, you, and you don't realize that you're draining your, your, your resources, because I'm really, ex- I love the work that I do. And yeah. once I get going, sometimes I don't even realize, oh, you're human. There's certain, you have human needs, <laughs> certain yeah. things you need to do. And you're going for hours and hours. So it's important to just have something that is at your reach when you feel your blood sugar dropping. <laughs> for sure. And, you know, so I, I usually have a snack and then I usually have like some sort of icebreaker in my bag. I always have glitter or confetti in my bag. Really? It saves me with it with children and and adults honestly (laughs) i i I like to have something fun in my bag so like how would you use glitter with adults i'm so curious glitter is just a fun addition to to it's a it's an icebreaker for children so i'm sure you can imagine oh yeah well to pick out glitter and but it's also an icebreaker for for adults as well like particularly i'll just have take it out and have them blow the glitter. That's a kind of cl- uh, a fun shot that a lot of people do. Okay. But I have it because it get, gets people warmed up. It's a distraction. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And they're probably not expecting it. Like this photographer at their wedding suddenly pulls out a little jar of glitter and has people start yes. throwing that around. It becomes a like you started a party right there. Right, right. It's just, it's just, it's a great warm up. To, to and a great icebreaker, especially you know, with situations where you're walking in, and sometimes you're working with somebody for the first time, nerves are on high. I have other things that I do, but in terms of what's in my bag, that that would be one of the things that is you can usually find in my bag, my camera bag. Okay, all right, that's yeah. a, that's a great idea, though. I, mean, I don't know that we've had a guest on yet that has talked about an icebreaker, specifically something that, that can encourage connection in some way or help somebody smile. And, you know, there are nerves innate to or associated a lot of times with being photographed and this idea, okay, here's the photographer. Now we're at, I'm at this wedding and I'm going to be photographed. Am I doing this right? And there's some, there's some nerves, a bit of an edge there and anything you can do to help take off the edge. I mean, conversation is a great place. Friendliness, kindness is a great place to start, but, but sometimes people just don't even respond to that because they're so nervous. And so having, having something in your bag to break the ice is a great idea. I think, I think it'd be fun to do magic too. Like, I don't know, maybe that would totally distract from the day, (laughs) but if you could figure out some way to incorporate magic into it, if if I was a wedding photographer again, that might be what I'd do. But I, I like this idea of an icebreaker and having something like that along both for kids and, and adults, both. I think that's great. Yes, absolutely. I'm good for a cheesy joke. I, I don't know about magic tricks. I'm, pro- I'm not sure I would be the best magician, okay. but I'm, I'm a teller of cheesy, <laughs> deep cheesy jokes. <laughs> okay. Do, do you have a, like just an internal list? Do you have a book that you reference? No, I, it's definitely more something in the moment. Okay. I can usually tell like, well, my I, you met Neil, so, and he's like, He's a walking comedian, so I, I blame him. Kind of picked it up from. I've been married to him for many, many years. Yeah, it's like 
kind of the culture in our household where we're always roasting each other or just telling little silly, silly word jokes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So kind of, kind of embedded in my personality. It's not always funny (laughs) or I shouldn't say it's, it's so bad. They're they're so bad. My jokes are so bad. They are funny. (laughs) I totally get it. I'm not a natural (laughs) comedian either. In fact, literally I've, I've gone on multiple times now on Amazon looking for books about how I can be a more entertaining conversationalist because I can sit all day and ask questions and, and go deep with people. But when it comes to being amusing or entertaining, I feel like I fall short big, big time. Like I, I'm <laughs> awkward even in fact. And I'm so curious to, to learn how to do that. But riddles, rid- riddles is it good. riddles? Is that what we'll do it? I love riddles. So okay. <laughs> if you want something, so I have a couple of them that I've I've told people and it all, almost always gets a big reaction. So that's a good place to start. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. I may have to, yeah, maybe I have to look up some riddles <laughs> or maybe I'll just have to call up Neil and be like, Hey Neil, I, I need some pointers here. I need some help. <laughs> I want to be more like you. Well, l- let's jump on to, to our kind of primary focus and conversation for today, because um, this sure. is one that we haven't we haven't spent a ton of time on maybe three or four episodes of the you know 250 plus or so that we've put out but associate photographers there there is an interesting i mean there's so many different directions honestly that we can go in this topic about associate photographers but let me just get a little bit of context for myself and for our listeners when when it comes to associate photographers granted it it kind of enables us to be able to go beyond ourselves and and potentially explore opportunities that didn't exist as a sole proprietor, as an individual photographer. But it, it takes making the move in that direction. Did you always plan on expanding your team and having associate photographers? Or was this something that just kind of happened upon you? I'd say there was a shift in my business that was so pervasive that I had to listen to it. Oh, wow. So I kind of, when I started out, i definitely was passionate about, I'm passionate about photography. I wanted to be a photographer. And my immediate thought process was to be able to earn a living with doing something that I personally enjoy doing. Yeah, Definitely more the sole proprietor, self-employed mindset. Thankfully, I grown my business to a certain point where I was fielding a lot of inquiries. And I just simply by numbers, there would be no way that I personally could provide the service to the to the number of people who were inquiring. Or alternatively, I noticed that the people who weren't booking, there were certain barriers that were consistent, the consistent reasons that were being shared as to why they opted not to book with me. And so those cues are kind of what tipped me off that I needed to explore this option. And how long ago did this happen? Because you mentioned being in business full time anyway for for about five years now. Was this something more recent, or has it been a little while now? Yes, it's very recent. I would say this is my second year of implementing this associate part of my business. Wedding season twenty seventeen is that point where I noticed the shift, and my husband, who is very sales minded and very that's his background. He's also business, business growth minded. And he kind of sat me down and had a, we had a long talk about, about it. And that, that 2017 marked the shift when I really said, I need to put structure in place and start exploring this as an option. Well, and I think we alluded to this just a couple of minutes ago, the significance of, of going beyond just being a sole proprietor or that mentality figuring out how to develop a business model that can scale. And, you know, if we're talking about scaling and growth that goes beyond what we are capable of as individuals, it it takes a willingness to be open-minded to, to hiring a team, whether it's a small team or a large team, we have to go beyond ourselves. And you talk about that, that conversation that Neil had with you. Can you give us any insight into that conversation? Like what was it that he was encouraging you to, to shift away from? So, Part of being a photographer is that you are investing some of yourself personally into your work. Yeah. The work, even though it's a business, is very personal. You know, I was in a space where I couldn't imagine not being the person personally helping my the couples that we work with. Mm. My mindset was such that 
I wanted to personally touch each person's wedding. Yeah. The talk that Neil had with me is, is your business going to be structured as a commissioned artist or do you want to function as a business because you have potential to function as a business? And I, it really was a talk about why are we, why are we in this? Why are we doing this? Are, do, we can keep things, we can grow a business out of the commissioned artist format. Sure. There are things you can do to diversify your, your income stream, but we were looking at numbers that showed the potential for it, for the, the business to expand in a way beyond it being book cash up personally. Huh. And so that was the talk that we had looking at how many people were initiating contact with us about their weddings or about events. It was it was kind of like obvious at the time that I, I'm basically throwing away, <laughs> throwing away potential by not tapping into this. And so right. it was a it was a it was a tough love talk. <laughs> and but it was an important shift that got me here. Well, and, and so first of all, the tough love talk, I love I, I, I'm very, I have so much respect for you, Neil. I, I just, I felt like, and maybe it was just the personal experience that I was having internally, but I just really felt like I connected well with you two. Neil, I, I had the most conversation with when we were in Connecticut at that workshop, but I really like your vibe, the two of you as a couple, your vibe. Thank you. And I have a lot of respect too, for the fact that you were willing to, to sit down um, together, have a conversation. I mean, when when you talk about the, the notion of tough love, it requires kind of setting ego aside, right? Somebody comes to you, whether it's somebody close to you or not, and sometimes it's a more sensitive issue, I guess, if it's somebody really close to you who comes to you and says, hey, you could be better. And it's not right. being being able to set ego aside and take a comment like you could be better, not as a personal attack, but oh man, this person gets what I'm capable of and I need right. to open my mind to to their suggestion. Um, I think it's a really important, you talked about self-awareness earlier. It's really important to develop enough self-awareness that we can do that versus just immediately getting defensive because you pointed out there, there are certainly opportunities to, to be the individual commissioned artist and to work with a small number of clients. And there, there is plenty of opportunity for that, but there is another side to this too, which is that you can build a scalable business. Neil saw that potential in you and, and essentially encouraged that in you. And you were willing to, to be open to that. I think this is a great example, both for relationships and for business owners and props to props to Neil too. Um, But, but yeah, seriously, mad respect to to both of you for the way that you're, you're, I mean, I have to, this is a little bit of a side note. I love the, the vibe that you give off when it comes to your family. You have, it's, it's four kids, right? Three. Three kids. I'm sorry. Okay, so you have three, three <laughs> kids. I, I was I was looking at pictures of of your family, and I, I think I saw a fourth person here, and there maybe it was a friend or something. But um, they have cousins. <laughs> okay. They they have a we have a huge a huge extended family. So every now and again, we have cousins in the pictures with them, <laughs> uh, which is great, which is wonderful. Yes. But I, regardless, you're the, the family vibe. I mean, the focus on family and relationships seems to be a significant priority to you all as well. It is. Well, and, and big, it's a big, big part of who we are. So. Well, and, and it's very clear. It's very obvious. And I think it's very beautiful the way that, that you portray that. And, and the fact that you have space, not you've made space, not only for that, but for the two of you. And then again, for these kinds of conversations, it's a great example for um, our listeners, just when it comes to relationships. But again, when it comes to business and open mindedness to the possibility that there is room for improvement, for expansion and for growth is also a wonderful example. And I'm to that point, and maybe you've already alluded to this a little bit, but I'm curious, what are some of the lessons that you had to learn that enabled you then to make that shift? You have this conversation with Neil, and you're like, you know what, I get it. Yeah, it, I, I can I can make this change and we could go places with this. Did you have to make any significant shifts personally in order to to make that change? I did. So one of the most significant shifts was investing time and energy in growing my team. Okay. And I knew that I wanted it to be. So I started. I I started small. Uh, I have two associates, and I knew that I wanted to invest time and energy in in growing my team uh t- following the same kind of organic model that i did in developing a uh, business a client base for myself i wanted to do that for the people on my team 
And uh, so that shift required me kind of letting go of trying to, to, to get people. Not, I didn't necessarily want them to do things exactly the way I did, but wanting, wanting the associates who work with me to follow my philosophy and, and approach and finding people who did. Uh, and and then once I do find people who did developing, helping to develop them to be prepared to work, follow that philosophy and approach, and work with the clients that that we we work with. That's a that's a really big shift too. I mean, this is something that I've realized even more recently. I run an, an editing company. I help run an editing company, and when a photographer begins to work with photographers edit, and they're outsourcing or delegating editing work to us they're having to to learn to become a manager and this is not something that a sole proprietor is is used to right i mean it's it's right. it's even it's been a learning curve for me actually beginning to work with a, a larger team and learning how to effectively delegate and to communicate what it is i mean this is the big one especially with a photographer working with photographers edit we're essentially their employee they're the employer they're the boss and what we need them to do is tell us what they want. And many, if not most photographers are not used to effectively communicating what it is that they want to an employee. So this is a massive learning curve. I totally understand how this has got to be a big shift for you going from being the individual photographer. Now you've got, you begin to hire someone or a couple of photographers on, and you have to figure out how to effectively communicate what it is that you want to them. Right. Was that, was there a bit of a learning curve there? Well, there's, there was a learning curve definitely in shifting to to the the people le- leading the team you yeah. know like so yes there a lot of uh, a lot of adjustments needing to be made in terms of letting certain things go you know letting i'm very much in control of all the finite <laughs> things that we do in business and and you know sometimes we when we started uh we would get a a couple and I would really, somebody I'm excited to work with. And I, uh, there's an emotional piece to it too. So yes, the, the man learning how to, to delegate and learning how to trust other people to do things that you would normally be doing is a big part of it. The emotional detachment for me <laughs> in not being the person who actually shot the wedding was a shift also. Yeah. Well, you mentioned letting go control, right? I mean, that's uh, so much of it is rooted in that, that baseline idea, which is I no longer have, as you said, kind of infinite control over every little thing. Now I have to give that up in order for my business to scale in order for it to grow. And of course, in order to scale, I have to bring somebody on or some other people on. That means that not everything that is done in my business now is going to be exactly the way that I did it. But yet again, I have to set ego aside in order to accept the fact that my business can actually not only do well, but grow significantly if I'm willing to give up that kind of control. Right. That's huge. That's huge. It is. And I'd say another thing would be that to allow it time that Rome wasn't built in a day. So allowing time for just the same way I followed a a growth trajectory, right? I, the same will apply for the associates, mm. uh, allowing time for for them to come in, into their own. And, and it does take time. There were bumps. <laughs> There's still, you know, in year two, it's been significant this year versus last year, last wedding season. And it's just a matter of allowing that space and time for, for this to develop and being patient with the process. Yeah. Wow. And and this is a good reminder and it very much resonates with me as well. I'm, I'm even in the last six months, maybe even less, I'm realizing that I need to, to just take a deep breath and, and relax a little bit. Stop expecting things to happen right this second. You talked about the significance of consistency earlier, and that ties in very beautifully here. You just have to continue to push forward, to be consistent in the effort and understand that some things are going to take time. And the world's not going to end if they don't happen right this second. As long as you're consistent and you're basing your day-to-day workflow and and the way that you're running your business, the business model on on solid values and goals, you're going to be good. And and that's that's such a great reminder because it is so easy, especially in a day when we're we're used to getting things right now. You know, Amazon just made the switch not too long ago to to overnight shipping now for Prime members, and I mean it's amazing. We're, we're getting so used to the immediacy 
of our desires right. being fulfilled. And yet the reality is a lot of this, a lot of the bigger stuff, like running a business, it's still going to take some time and we have to be okay with that. Uh, be yes. consistent, continue to push forward. But these are, these are two really big shifts. I mean, first of all, investing in a team and learning what it's like to, to manage a team. Um, but then also the significance of allowing for time to, to run its course, uh, learning to be patient in that. That's, that's a really, those are two pretty significant shifts as an individual, as a business owner. And I think this is good perspective for our listeners too, who are considering the possibility of building a team and expanding their business. Uh, these are going to be two big shifts that they have to make and, and being prepared mentally for those, I think is really important. So I appreciate the awareness that you bring that, um, or bring to those things. But I'm curious, just as we close here, what has bringing on a team or growing a team enabled you to do as a business that you couldn't before? Well, the, the biggest, the largest thing that it has changed for, for me is that the growth element there, the number of couples or clients who would have booked but for their budget or clients who would have booked but for the fact that I was unavailable, I've been able to seal some of those client relationships. Yeah. And the client relationships when it comes to weddings goes beyond the wedding day. And so even though I might not have personally touched the wedding, as in I might not have personally been the photographer to capture the wedding, I still have the relationship with the client leading up to the wedding day. And even after the wedding day, a lot of our couples become uh, clients for other things afterwards because we are people photographers. So it's opened the door for client relationships that I might not have otherwise had. And so that's one of the major, major things that shifts that it has had for my business. The other shift is that I do have more time for myself. There's not this sense of the business is able to function and, and grow and earn even in instances where I'm not physically present to provide the service. Yeah. So those are the two big benefits that I've had from, from pursuing this part of the, the business. And you alluded to something when it comes to growth and being able to reach more clients than you would as an individual. Obviously, you, there, are, there are a lot of weddings out there to go around and, and having a team of photographers means you can take more of them on. But you also alluded to different price points or different market segments. This is something right. that you've been able to explore with your team as well? Yes. This allows me to explore a, a market segment that might not have that wouldn't because of budget been able to work with me or might have chosen not to work with me because of my price point. We structure our associate pricing so that it reaches a, another market in terms of wedding budgets, wedding photography budget. Yeah, which is which is a really important. I mean, you know, as many as many conversations as you hear out there about going uh, after the so-called high end bride or even mid to high end bride because. You know, we're talking I mean, even somebody being able to afford to pay, say, five thousand dollars or even three to four thousand dollars for a wedding photographer is is actually quite a luxury. You know, in, in the established wedding photography industry, photographers who've been around for a little while, um, charging that price point just seems like the norm. The reality is, much a large percentage, if not a, most of the 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 population here, just looking at the U.S. market, for example. Um, could not afford to pay four or five thousand dollars for a wedding photographer. When I got married back in two thousand, my parents paid six hundred dollars for our, our wedding photographer, and we certainly got what we paid for. <laughs> but but simultaneously, yes. that was all my parents could afford. Like that was actually a lot of money for my parents for the right, little bit right. of money that they actually made. So that's the reality for a, a massive percentage of the population. And so understanding that the market doesn't all function in one way, you know, as much as we prioritize art and photography, no amount of talking about that is going to enable somebody making $35,000 a year to, to go hire a $6,000 wedding photographer. There are right. other market segments that need to be served and figuring out creative ways to do that, including bringing on additional team members who can serve that segment of the market is is it's not only important and intelligent, but it's needed. Right. And it certainly opens up doors for once you've gained a client relationship, it's invaluable. Each client relationship is, uh, is like a, a tree that can branch off into other client relationships. Yeah. Through my associate program, I found a way to provide a quality photography experience to a different segment of the wedding market. 
And also gaining these client relationships causes, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a tree that branches off into future business. Mm. And so it's, it's just, as you said, it's, it, it makes it smart. It's smart business sense to find ways to, to reach that, that market segment. And you do have control over it. So we're not offering, you know, bargain basement <laughs> photography sure, sure. or, you know, we, we, we find that you do have control over how you set that, the structure of your associate pricing so that it is attainable to that greater segment of the, the market who is not in the, you know, 5k North segment of the market. You find a way to serve, serve, provide that service, and then you get gain a new client relationship. And to me, that's a win-win. Yeah, we've got a you've got a wider reach, right? A broader net, right. if you will. And there is so much opportunity out there. Just incredible numbers of weddings here in the U.S. And while there are a lot of photographers, um, the the established photographers who know how to run a business, who have established business model, have incredible opportunity if they're intelligent about it and they understand how to set up the right systems and to hire a team. There's incredible opportunity to tap into that to, to those other segments of the market. And again, it's much needed. So I, I like I like that you've figured out a way to go about doing that. And and this is again a great example for our our listeners. I really right. appreciate you making time, Kesha, for for this conversation today and, and being willing to share a little bit of your insight and your experience with our listeners. Can you just share one more time where they can find you and follow you online? Yes, and thank you so much for having me. This, I'm honored to join you on, your, on this podcast, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on and share. Oh, I'm, I'm glad we finally got to make it happen. Yes. <laughs> so um, you can find me at my website, www.keshalambert.com, K-E-S-H-A-L-A-N-B-E-R-T.com. I'm pretty simple with everything else. Everything is my name. I'm on Instagram at Kesha Lambert and Facebook Kesha Lambert. Perfect. We'll, we'll link to all these in the show notes. And um, of course, the show notes, again, for those of you listening in, Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. You can find the show notes for today's episode and other episodes as well. There are a lot of them out there. But uh, once again, thanks again for uh, for hanging out with us today, Kesha. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca Podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Dot com.